Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, your Monday rundown of all the latest and greatest space launches, missions, and, of course, Starship development updates. We have loads to discuss once again. From the aforementioned Starship program, SpaceX pulled off a third Falcon 9 mission within the span of just five days. Boeing finally heads to the International Space Station with their Starliner in a mostly perfect flight, and China placed three communication satellites into orbit, and Astra reveal a brand new, bigger, badder rocket. All this and more, let's begin with Starship news. The two vehicles currently at the centre of attention with the Starship program are Ship 24 and Booster 7. These are, of course, still expected to be the first orbital flight vehicles, with Booster 7 being the first super heavy to fly, and I guess it'll also be the first vehicle to fly under the power of Raptor 2, being closely followed by Ship 24 after main engine cutoff. Ship 24 appears to be fully stacked now, with just a few minor additions needed before it can be rolled out to begin its testing campaign. Meanwhile, Booster 8, successor to Booster 7, is rapidly growing as well. Last week, SpaceX moved the booster's liquid oxygen tank from the mid-bay into the high bay and then began installing the methane transfer tube. And once this is complete, we should see the liquid oxygen and methane sections mated together to complete the full stack of this booster. I wonder if the Booster 8 methane transfer tube has been altered from its original design following the implosion of the same tube during a cryo test of Booster 7. We know that Booster 7's tube has now been repaired, as it seems to be undergoing cryo testing without any problems now, but part of me does still wonder if SpaceX have, internally, relegated 7 to ground tests, and Booster 8 is now planned to be the first Super Heavy to launch an orbital flight. This would, of course, match the leak from the internal source that informed us that Ship 20 and Booster 4 had been demoted to ground testing only, which came out several months before SpaceX officially retired the two vehicles. That same leak stated that Booster 8 would be the first booster to fly, not Booster 7. Now, we might just have a situation here where the current Booster 7 was at one time called Booster 8 and namings have just changed, or maybe the structural failure it underwent was the fulfilling of some sort of prophecy. <laughs> what do you think? Let me know your thoughts down below. I'm really interested to hear if you think it'll be Booster 7 or Booster 8 to make the first flight. And hey, while you're doing that, if you are enjoying the video so far, then dropping a like and a subscription down below really helps me out, and I always do appreciate it. One of the things that looks for certain is a static fire test for Booster 7. While this won't be the first static fire of a Super Heavy, that goes to Booster 3, this will be the first static fire of both a Raptor 2 engine on a booster and the first time we see a Raptor boost engine. The Raptor boost engines are the ones on the outer ring of the Super Heavy and are only ignited once for the initial launch and they don't relight after main engine cutoff because they need stage zero in order to start. The fact that SpaceX are installing these outer Raptors is a good indication that we might end up seeing all 33 Raptor engines installed on Booster 7 before the static fire attempt. A static fire attempt might be coming fairly soon actually, as the first methane tanker truck was spotted offloading methane at the orbital tank farm, which is the first delivery of methane we've seen since the installation of the horizontal methane tanks, which were constructed as a replacement for the vertical tanks, which as it turns out don't meet safety regulations with Texas law when it comes to the storage of methane. Lolo Matico 3D is definitely worth following on Twitter. They've been creating these great infographics detailing the progress of the second Starship orbital launch tower that SpaceX are currently constructing at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Now, to be clear, this isn't what the tower actually looks like right now. It just shows us which parts have been spotted, mounted, and which ones are yet to be seen. In real life, all of these tower segments are still on the ground. Here, you can see that four of the eight main tower segments have been completed, with a fifth and sixth segment under construction. The Florida launch tower is actually believed to be slightly taller than the one at Boca Chica. To my knowledge, nobody is quite sure why yet, but one theory put forward by Twitter user Luna Caveman is that it will allow the chopsticks to raise high enough to clear for a crew access arm. Here's a diagram of what this might look like. At this stage though, it's really just speculation. SpaceX completed the third of their three back-to-back -back Falcon 9 launches last week. Now, I covered the first two flights of this series in last Monday's episode, which saw SpaceX launch two Falcon 9 Starlink launches less than 24 hours apart. 
Last week on Wednesday, SpaceX launched another Starlink mission, Starlink Group 418, from the Kennedy Space Center. While not under the 24-hour mark from the previous flight, like with the other two Falcon 9 launches, this flight's success still carries the achievement of wrapping up three successful Falcon 9 flights in the space of just five days. The booster, B-1052, executed a successful landing on the drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas, about 633 kilometers downrange from the launch site. This flight places SpaceX's total number of Falcon 9 missions this year at 21, officially overtaking their number of Falcon 9 flights they achieved for the entire year of 2018. This mission also puts SpaceX one step closer to achieving their lofty goal of completing a total number of 60 launches by the end of the year. Over in China, a Long March 2C launch vehicle took to the skies from the Chuquan launch site in northwest China on Friday. The rocket was carrying three satellites, which according to official sources have all successfully entered their planned orbits and will now carry out tests and verifications of in-orbit communication technologies. Less information is known about these satellites compared to what we normally hear from Chinese launches, which is admittedly usually already very vague. It's yet to be confirmed what any of these satellites are actually called, and as for everything else, all we know is that all three are for communications purposes. Two of them are owned by the Changcheng Institute of Optics, Fine Mechanics and Physics, while the third satellite operator is yet to be announced. Watch this space, I guess. Now, nine months ago, Boeing attempted to launch its Starliner spacecraft to the International Space Station. Unfortunately, some valve issues grounded the vehicle and engineers had to eventually de-stack it to make repairs. But it would seem that the issues were fixed and a second launch attempt was made last week. And the rocket took off already much more successful than the last attempt. The Atlas V performed flawlessly, as always, and the Starliner spacecraft successfully achieved orbit, and unlike the previous Starliner test flight, it managed to make it all the way to the International Space Station. The previous flight test of Starliner saw it fail to reach the desired orbit and it couldn't reach the station. While last week's flight was successful, there was a minor hiccup during the flight, as two of the vehicle's thrusters failed during the flight. One shut down too early, which caused the flight control system to transfer the flight to the second thruster, which unfortunately also encountered an early shutdown, causing the system to transfer over to a third thruster. Boeing have stated that these systems are built for redundancy and are overall pleased with the performance of the vehicle, though teams are now of course investigating the problem that caused the unexpected shutdowns ahead of the vehicle carrying human passengers. This is ultimately a flight test for Starliner, there is no crew on board, but it is carrying lots of cargo, crew supplies and test equipment to simulate future missions with astronauts and their cargo on board. Actually, you know what, I'm probably not being quite truthful when I say that the capsule had no crew on board, because it was being piloted by none other than Jebediah Kerman! Well, at least a plushy version of him. The crew of the International Space Station welcomed Jebediah aboard, and so far the station hasn't violently shaken itself apart or glitched across the solar system, so it looks like Jeb didn't bring the Kraken with him. <laughs> I was a little bit disappointed though by a lot of the responses to the Starliner success on Twitter. There was loads of negativity towards it and I think it's definitely worth reminding people that in the immortal words of Tori Bruno, it's possible to like two things at once. We can appreciate Starliner and Crew Dragon without tearing down the other and competition is a great thing in any industry after all. So I'm extremely pleased to see America come one step closer to have another vehicle capable of launching humans to space. Speaking of new launch vehicles, Astro Astra, the company behind Rocket 3, which recently entered operational service, revealed some details about what they're calling Launch System 2.0, which will include a new rocket called Rocket 4. Here is a picture of it here. This is the only image we have of Rocket 4, and so all I really have for B-roll is this picture. So I've just recreated it in Kerbal Space Program to give you something to look at while I continue on. Rocket 4 will be able to place 300 kilograms of payload into low Earth orbit and 200 into Sun synchronous orbit, nearly double the capacity of Rocket 3. One of the most notable changes from Rocket 3 to Rocket 4 will be the business end of the vehicle. Rocket 3 is powered by five Delphin engines, while Rocket 4 will just use two much bigger engines that together produce double the thrust of Rocket 3's five Delphins. Astra didn't disclose too much about the engines, other than the fact they're fed by turbo pump, rather than electric powered pumps like with Astra's Delphin and like Rocket Lab's Rutherford. 
However, The Verge reported last year that Astra planned to license Firefly Aerospace's Reva engine, which is similar in performance to the engine described in the Rocket 4 presentation. During the presentation, the question of reusability was raised, which is a particularly interesting point to bring up given the recent strides that Rocket Lab have been making with recovery of their electron booster. Astra's Chief Technology Officer Adam London stated that while reusing rockets is incredibly cool, he argued that the economics didn't make sense for Astra. Astra aims to eventually achieve a weekly launch cadence for Rocket 4, and right now, they hope to conduct the first Rocket 4 launch in late 2022. I personally can't wait to see this thing fly, and I also can't wait to give a big thank you to all the amazing names scrolling on the left. Yes, they're my Patreon and channel members whose support allows me to make this sort of content and stuff like the challenge I did this weekend where I streamed a live attempt at going to the MUN in Kerbal Space Program without time warp or quick saves. The whole thing lasted about 20 hours and it was great fun and super satisfying to do. The VOD is now up on my channel page if you want to check it out, but otherwise, thank you so much for flying with me today and I'll see you all next time.